everyone, and welcome to the 11 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. session of the 2020 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are happy to introduce a presentation called State of the Open Simulator Community. Our speaker is Maria Korolov. Maria Korolov is a published author and covers artificial intelligence for CIO Magazine and cybersecurity for CSO Online. She is also the editor of Hypergood Business since 2009. During her 20 years as a journalist, she's run a business news bureau in Shanghai, covered wars in the former Soviet Union, and has written about local politics for the Chicago Tribune. But none of that prepared her for covering Open Simulator, which has been both intensely frustrating and infinitely enjoyable. And today, she'll talk to us about Open Simulator. Please check out the website found at conference.opensimulator.org for speaker bios, details of sessions, and the full schedule of events. The session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC20. Welcome everyone. Let's begin the session. Well, thank you very much for having me. I love being at this conference every year. And as you can see this year, my hair is quite a bit longer. It's the pandemic hair because I haven't been able to get to the hairdresser. Um, and it looks pretty much the way it does in real life. So, yay. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, we're going to be talking today about the hypergood business statistics that we collect every year um, and every month um, in our database. So, and that's uh, located at hypergoodbusiness.com. In case any of you don't know it, it's an online blog. We've got probably a couple of hundred um, contributors, uh, more than 3 million visitors over these past 10 years. And um, every month we, we publish a stats report about open SIM statistics. And um, so you can go online to get it. And my email is maria at hypergoodbusiness.com. I've posted it in local chat earlier. If you have any story suggestions, or if you want us to cover something, or if you would like to contribute an article, opinion, essay, review, travel log, uh, or if you want to run a free, free ad. All our ads are free. We have free ads for all community, open sim community events, grids, uh, anything at all open sim related. Uh, so um, do come check us out if you haven't yet. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about specifically the stats that we do every year. And last year, the stats were down across the board, but this year they have gone up, possibly because of the pandemic. In our database, we've had over 400 grids that were active at some point this year. And in these grids, we count public grids, grids that have public websites where you can create an account or grids that are accessible via the hypergrid and post events, announcements, so people can come in and visit them. So this is not somebody's individual grid that they run at home and don't tell anybody about, or a closed company grid, because, well, well, first of all, you know, it's not really a benefit to our readers to know about those grids, but also there's no way for us to find out, out about those grids. In OpenSIM, anybody can run a grid behind their firewall or at home for free, uh, without telling anybody, and there is no way to track those numbers. And uh, by some earlier estimates, this hidden dark metaverse is like several times bigger than the known metaverse of known public grids. So OpenSIM is a pretty decent sized platform. It's a niche platform, but it's not as small as sometimes we think it is. So, um, uh, the hypergrid is still huge. There is only one gr major grid that's not accessible to the hypergrid, and that's TAG. Um, so, uh, and uh, about 92% of all active users in OpenSIM 
live on hypergrid enabled grids and travel between grids. And 97% of all land area is on the open public grids. Um, and that's generally because hypergrid enabled grids tend to be less expensive than the closed commercial or proprietary grids. So uh, the average cost of land in open sim this year, by the way, uh, it's not on the slide, but I happen to know it off the top of head, is $15 a month for a standard size region. That's equivalent to like a second life region in terms of permissive capacity. $15 a month. And there's half, that means half of all grids rent those regions at less than $15 a month. You can get a lot of land in OpenSIM really inexpensively. Um, and uh, that's also not considering the fact that some grids offer variable size regions. So you can get your regions spread across a lot of land area, two by two, four by four, you know, eight by eight, and, and even bigger for the same price. So that is an awesome uh, new technology that's really, really spread across the hypergrid and become kind of like default table stakes for grids this year. Um, so, um, so our users, as you can see, they went down a little bit. Um, uh, the, the regions went down a little bit in 2019 and they've gone up again in 2020. And so have, where's our users? Here's our users. And the same thing happened with our active users. They went down last year, they went back up this year. Um, now that just could be natural growth, uh, or it could be because of this huge, horrible pandemic that happened this year. And I'm gonna be talking about this later. Uh, last month, we did our annual OpenSIM grid survey where we ask people to rate the grid that they're on. Now, with 400 grids out there, we weren't asking people to compare grids because nobody's visited all 400 grids. So we asked people just to rate their own grid. So, you know, on average, people liked the grid they were on. We had about 250 people vote this year. And Kitely uh, was the grid that uh, most of our respondents spent most of their time on. That's the grid that they rated, followed by Open OS Grid, Craft, uh, DigiWorld, Discovery, and Tranquility, and a whole bunch of other grids. And this is the grids people visited, because uh, all the grids that I mentioned are hypergrid enabled grids, which means that people can easily travel to another grid um, in order to go to a uh, non-hypergrid enabled grid, they would have to create uh, a new account. So we also asked people what other grids that they've been on. And OS Grid obviously is in the lead. It's the oldest grid, it's the biggest grid. It's a nonprofit that allows people to connect home-based regions for free. So if you have a home computer and an internet connection, you can have your own land for free in OpenSAM, as much of it as your computer can support. And usually you can support like a four region little space pretty easily on a home, on a typical home computer. And you can support a handful of simultaneous visitors on a typical home connection. So this is a really, really good deal. If you have a couple of friends and you want them to visit you and you want to have land on a big major grid, OS Grid has a very easy region installer that you can use and you just spin up a region and there you are, free virtual land online that all the pretty much all the open sim users can access. Um, and open sim users love their grids. 95% of our respondents said that they would absolutely recommend their grid to others. And that's up from 91% last year. There were some unhappy people last year. Um, and uh, and hardly anybody said definitely not. It was like around you know two percent. So um, uh, whatever the grids are doing, uh, the 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 major grids that people were rating, uh, they're doing it pretty well. Uh, we also asked grids to be scored on in various categories, uh, including content, community, support, and technology. So you can see 
that the grids that got the most votes, how they did. Uh, so Terra Nova did very well this year, which is a smaller startup grid that people had to write in their vote for it. And Utopia Sky also did very well. Uh, and not surprisingly, Kitely uh, did well as well. Now you might see that OS Grid is a little bit further down here in this, but that's to be expected because as I said, people sign in with home-based regions and every home computer connection is different. So the regions might not be up all the time. It might not be that stable. It might not be that fast. And also the grid's a nonprofit run by volunteers. So tech support can be a little uneven depending on you know, how the volunteers feel that day because they're volunteers. Um, so, so it rates a little bit less than some of the other bigger commercial grids, but that doesn't mean that it's a worse grid. It just means that they do more for people with fewer, with less staff and at a scale that nobody else sees in OpenSAM. Um, now we ask people specifically about technology and Mobius, Terra Nova, and Utopia Sky got excellent scores. Uh, Mobius Grid was uh, is an innovative grid. Um, they're uh, dedicated to gaming. It's it's one of the focus of their grids, and they were some of the first to roll out some new features like um, Globit Payments. They were in the lead for that, and and some of the other new experimental features. And their users are noticing. Uh, Terra Nova and Utopia Sky also had perfect scores for support and content. Again, these are smaller grids, so it's easier for a smaller grid to really devote a lot of time and attention to their residents, and it's harder to do it for a larger grid. It doesn't so 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 keep these statistics with a little bit of grain of salt there. As grids get bigger, it doesn't mean that they get worse. It means that it's harder for them to do all these things. Uh, and again, Terra Nova had a perfect score for community, followed by Mobius and Tranquility Grid. Um, and uh, we asked people what, uh, how many other grids they've been to. Now, uh, keep in mind that this is based on how many grids people remember visiting. And so like me, for example, I've probably visited hundreds of grids. But if you're to ask me the, to name the grids I've visited, I can probably name maybe a dozen before I, I just I just give up. So the people who submitted our survey were asked to name the other grids that they visited. On average, they've been to four and a half different grids on, in addition to the grid that they lived on. So the open sim is definitely a community. When people once people figure out how to use the open sim viewer and they get in and they get in for the first time, that then they look around, they travel to other grids, they explore the hypergrid, um, and that that for me is 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 very encouraging because I like to think of this as a metaverse. This is like um, the internet compared to the walled garden that AOL had, right? This uh, Open Sims, the World Wide Web, and Linden Lab is AOL. So that's kind of how I went in, into it, thinking about it ten years ago. And I kind of still think that way, except that OpenSim hasn't quite taken off the way the World Wide Web has. But that's a topic for a very different, much longer discussion. Um, I also want to talk about some of the this uh, year's biggest news stories before we go on to answering some questions. Um, so first of all, the pandemic. Um, user counts went up in OpenSim uh, in the spring, and then they went up again a lot in the fall as people stayed home during the pandemic. And in fact, in May, Linden Lab announced that they were having trouble getting enough server capacity to create the all the new Second Life regions that people wanted, which uh, I guess is a nice problem for them to have, um, especially considering that they haven't had a lot of issues with growth in the past uh, few years. Um, 
we had uh, several grids open and close um, this year, and some grids did both. So the Great Canadian Grid closed last winter. Uh, there were, you know, te technical issues and funding issues, and then the owner got sick with coronavirus in March and ended up in a hospital. That grid came back up in October, and they're trying to recover operations. And um, uh, I mean, it's a disputed question as to how well they're going to be able to recover, um, but they're going to need help if uh, if that's something that you're interested in. If you have a personal feeling for the Great Canadian Grid, it had a very strong supportive community for several years. Um, it's it's one of my shining examples of one of the benefits of Open Sim. You can take a community, like a community in Second Life or a community somewhere else online, and you can bring them into Open Sim and create a grid for them. And you can do it really inexpensively and just unleash their creativity and unleash the, the, the group community feeling. And, and that's something that I've, I've seen happen with, with many different groups. And it continues to happen. We will talk about this with the creativity panel later on this afternoon, how other groups are also coming to OpenSim and taking advantage of it and building communities. Oh, oh, and the other big dramatic open and closing thing was Avi Worlds. Uh, and I do want to summarize this. This is really funny because yesterday I got a bunch of notes from from Alex Pompaselli about his new grid shutting down again. So Avi Worlds um, uh, has been around for a long time, has been officially closed like more than a dozen times. Lots of drama, lots of business models. People call it the yo-yo grid. Um, it's it was it's a nightmare for residents. Uh, great fun for journalists, of course, to cover this, um, but not so much fun if you have property on the grid and it just disappears with no warning, and everything shut down and all the social media sites are shut down. You can't communicate with anybody. Um, this is not how you close a grid, folks. By the way, give people notice at least a month's notice to collect their content, figure out another home, you know, prepare for, for like everything they need to prepare. If you can't give people a month's notice, um, you, you're just going to leave a bad, a bad taste in everybody's mouth and you're going to have a really hard time working on your next project, which is what happened with Alex Pompasella. Every time he closes and reopens, it gets harder and harder for him to get any traction because of, of his bad history with, with the previous, um, previous incarnations of the grid. So this spring, he sold it to a former business partner, Josh Bohm, who has been running it very successfully and steadily and reliably ever since. Um, but, but of course, Alex couldn't let that go. So he launched his own grid, Virtualville, uh, with, to big fanfare, lots of promises, shut down, that down again, relaunched it as a Avitron. Again, new business model, lots of promises. And then yesterday, people are telling me that he shut it down again. And I've, I and I talked to Alex, and yeah, he's like, "Oh, I can't do it, real life." Uh, so, which means it'll probably be up again as a, under a new name and a new incarnation tomorrow. Uh, meanwhile, he says he's helping Josh Bohm out with the old grid, um, Avi Worlds. I hope he doesn't interfere too much in its operations. Uh, so, um, and then for me, this the, this is the last bit of news before we open it up to questions. So for me, the sad thing was that um, Google has abandoned VR. Um, all, all, not completely, but it looks like they're really scaling back. They ended the day, day, Daydream uh, headset, which was my favorite phone-based headset. Um, they ended Expeditions, which was a, a school project where they gave out a bunch of headsets to schools, millions of students, visited destinations of virtual reality. That's been shut down. Nobody knows what's going to be instead of it. They shut down their poly 3D, 3D model uh, system. Um, and, and nobody knows what's going to happen next with uh, their, their VR stuff. Uh, we don't know what's happening with Apple's VR stuff. They're investing in VR and AR, but we're not really seeing anything happening. Um, so the only real work that's that's actually taking place with VR right now is the Facebook Oculus uh, ecosystem, 
which is a very closed proprietary kind of platform. And um, so that's disappointing to me because I do want to see an open metaverse with standards. And one thing that Google does is they do make their platforms like Android more or less open. Uh, so not necessarily like 100% open, but close to it. Um, so, and, and there's nobody uh, gearing to be the next one. High Fidelity has basically, in effect, shut down its operations uh, for all intents and purposes. So, okay. um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was it. That was the last slide. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we've got just, uh, I think we're allowed a minute or so here. There's just one question, if you can answer it very quickly. Uh -huh. um, Michael Christopher asked very early on if there's any idea how many unlisted grids there are in the metaverse. Uh, no, because there's really no way to know. For a while, the Open Simulator project was counting downloads, uh, but like a big organization could download it once and then install like a thousand different grids, you know, for all yeah. its students or whatever, or somebody could download it and not install it, but they stopped tracking downloads in any case. So that's okay. a moot point. And then once I did a, a talk to some hosting providers to see what percentage of their business customers were running in private mode versus public mode. And that's where I got the numbers that the hidden metaverse is several times bigger than the public one. Yeah. Okay. But again, again, no concrete data. And then Dream Grid also publishes their list of all their installs and they have several thousand. So again, that's also bigger than the public one, but that's a, again, a small segment of the whole open STEM ecosystem. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. We're out of time. So thank you, Maria, for that very informative Open Simulator update. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session is a meal break, and the next session will begin at 12.30 p.m. in this keynote region entitled, What Future for Immersive Social Spaces Panel? Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 20 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and to explore the Hypergrid Tour resources in Open OSCC Expo 2 region, along with the Real Gallery and the sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. Thank you again to our speaker and to our audience.